Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to another interesting episode here on Minibase. We have a few things we need to accomplish today. First, we need to start protecting ourselves from all the meteors. As you can see, the Abyssalite here is starting to take a little bit of damage. And if you're only used to playing on Spaced Out DLC, you may not be used to meteors coming down and hitting your base. But in vanilla, this was a common occurrence. So we're going to learn how to protect ourselves from it, and we're also going to figure out a system to collect all this beautiful regolith and some of these beautiful ores and refined metals. The next thing we're going to work on is water storage. Well, the water system in general, this monster vent here isn't going to go dormant for another 32 cycles. So I'd like to stock up as much water as we can before it does so. After all, this water is supplying our oxygen system and feeding a wonderful arbor tree that is providing branches for the pips that are providing dirt to the sage hatch, which is giving us a little bit of coal. I'd also like to modify the water flow system as well. Right now, it kind of works pretty good. The polluted water comes in from the vent through these buffer tanks. It skips past the carbon skimmer for now, but then goes directly in to the metal refinery if the metal refinery needs some coolant. Otherwise, it takes this bridge and discontinues on its merry way. The water exchanges temperature with this giant water pond here, where it comes out the other side at around 28 degrees. The polluted water then continues and splits off into two directions. One, a water sieve, which provides clean water for our electrolyzer and for the aforementioned carbon skimmer. The other 50% gets dropped off over here at this tree. Looks like I forgot to cut this with the pliers. We also have it providing a little bit of cooling for this mealwood to keep it within temps to keep feeding this Dreco. This system is one I put in off camera as we've seen it many times, and it works on vanilla just like it works on DLC. We have one Dreco supplying eggs for the incubator, but also all those eggs are gonna be dropped off into this hydrogen filled room. The reason why we have this is because we're then gonna start shearing all the Drecos and eventually the glossy Drecos that come through here in order to get all the plastic and thimble reed we'll need. We still have a little bit of work to do with this system because as you can see, there's still a Drecklet egg in here. We really need to get the shipping conveyor loader auto sweeper system in here. That way the eggs are automatically dropped off to the shearing and starvation chamber. Also, we're knocking out a bunch of research. We've already knocked out the steam turbine, which is great because now we're just waiting for a little bit of plastic to be able to build steam turbines. We have solid transport done with our conveyor loaders. Now we're just waiting for a mechatronics engineer to be able to install the stuff. We have bunker doors and bunker tiles, which are going to be required to stop those meteors. We also already have the thermo aqua tuners, which is great, but now we just got to start making some steel. And then finally, we're grabbing the robo miner, and it's going to come into play in the system that we're going to build at the top of the asteroid. And yes, I do realize the irony behind us starting to create steam turbines and thermo aqua tuners and yet we're still sitting on outhouses and wash basins. But this is for a pretty good reason. We actually want them to continue to use the outhouses because they're producing us polluted dirt, which we can then compost and create regular dirt. Yes, we still have 154 tons, but while we're still reliant on mealwood, we need to make sure we still have enough dirt running around to keep feeding our dupes. But now starts the dilemma. Remember I said we need to work on water storage, and here's the reason why. This polluted water vent has an absolute monster activity period at 105.5 cycles, and then it goes dormant for 71 cycles before it starts again. But because during its eruption period it's producing 10.8 kilograms of polluted water per second, the average output is huge at just over 3 kilos per second. So we'll need to do the math on how much storage we need, or in other words, how much water we need to save up during the activity period to last us during this dormancy period. We know that it's dormant for 71 cycles, and we get that just by subtracting the 176.5 from the 105.5 activity period, and we multiply that by 600 seconds, because there's 600 seconds in every cycle. And what this tells us is that there's 42,600 seconds of dormancy. The reason why we need to put this figure in seconds is because our average output is in seconds. So now we multiply the amount of dormancy seconds times the average output and we get an absolute ridiculous figure of 134.8 million grams of polluted water. To make this number a little bit easier to look at, we'll divide it by a thousand, and that gives us 134,880 kilos worth of polluted water. 
which means we need to store 134 tons worth of polluted water in order to make sure we're not losing any of the potential of this polluted water vent. Even though I'm a big fan of buffer tanks, considering each buffer tank can only hold five tons, this means we need 27 buffer tanks. Right now we have five. I don't know if we have the space for another 22 buffer tanks, but if the buffer knight has taught us anything, add more buffer tanks, and so we shall. This pool here can also be included in that storage. If we remember that we basically need to store 135 tons worth of polluted water, and we consider that each one of these tiles holds a ton of polluted water, well this brings that 135 down to 100, which means we would only need 20 buffer tanks. Which means if we make this tank a little bit larger, we could store 70 tons. In fact, including the two tons right here, that's 72 tons worth of polluted water that could be held in this space. Well, we take that 72 tons, we subtract it from the 135 tons of required storage, and we're given 63 tons. And 63 tons in buffer tanks is a little over 12 and a half buffer tanks. This is much more reasonable. So step one, let's do some changes here. I think we can move this water sieve up, open all this up, and then we're going to be able to put even more buffer tanks in this little area here. I also don't believe that once all this is done that we actually need access to this area, which means we don't need to put the ladder here, which gives us more potential space to put things like bottle emptiers and deodorizers. I guess first things first, we're going to have to get the duplicates a little bit wet, and we're going to open all this up which is great because the polluted water vent is over pressure so it would be really good to let some of that polluted water out oh that's much better already unfortunately we are going to have to deconstruct these liquid reservoirs which means we're going to have to redump the five tons of water each in through this bottle emptier so that's going to take a little time before we can seal this place off so i think temporarily we're going to put another bottle emptier down to help speed up that process some of you may have been wondering about the fact that this polluted water vent also comes with food poisoning germs. Well, unfortunately, there's not much we can do about it. So we're just living with the food poisoning germs. There's a lot of disinfecting going. I'm leaving it on right now just to kind of keep it at bay. But as you can see, the duplicates are just swimming in food poisoning. All right, the retrofit has been completed. We are now up to seven buffer tanks. Well, seven buffer tanks plus 72 tiles worth of storage. Now you may have wondered, what are we doing right now for sand? Well, that's a great question, and considering we're down to 259 kilos, it's time to actually make some more sand. So we're gonna go over to the granite and queue up another 40. Unfortunately, this is what we have had to resort to until we get this system here completed. Now's for stage two of the water system change. I added a few pipes here to the output of the metal refinery in the efforts of trying to let it output its coolant a little bit quicker, but it's still not performing the way I'd like to. So I'd like to put a buffer tank, of course, right here that would actually store all of the coolant and then let it slowly release off back into the main line. And I think with the addition of a bridge, we can make that happen. I also need to move these ladders around because as it stands, the reservoir will not be able to fit there, which means we have to move a whole bunch of things around in order to get the ladder somewhere else. I'm thinking right here is good, but that means we got to move all the coal generators over and this heavy watt wire. I'll be back in a minute. One of the positives about having a mini base is the duplicates don't have to run very far to do most of their tasks. So even though we only have five duplicates at this time, I was able to move all these coal generators over in fairly quick fashion. Now we have plenty of room to be able to put the liquid reservoir, but the interesting thing is going to be how I'm going to squeeze all this in, because I still need to get the output of the reservoir out there. But for right now, the plan is that the metal refinery outputs directly to the liquid reservoir, so the refinery is going to be able to empty its coolant immediately. But now I need to get this output here somehow on this line here. Unfortunately, this abyssalite here is 142 degrees, so I'd rather not open it up. But I think that might be our only possibility in order to squeeze this line in. Because remember, I want it on an output. And that way the tank has priority to empty, so it will not keep drawing polluted water from this line until the tank is completely empty. Alright, I figured it out. And it's a lot of spaghetti, but who doesn't like a nice bowl of pasta? Alright, so the way this works, 
the metal refinery's output comes out of this tile here, goes up into the bridge, skips over here, and then into the liquid reservoir here. The liquid reservoir then outputs into another bridge, skips over here, and then up and out through this bridge. And as you can see, because the liquid reservoir has water in it, this line has stopped flowing completely. And it will continue to stop because there was no room for it to jump across this bridge because this pipe here coming from the liquid reservoir has priority. That is, of course, until the metal refinery needs fresh coolant and then this pipe will continue flowing again. Now, right now we have a little bit of backup in the liquid reservoir, about two and a half tons worth, but that's only because we have a bunch of iron ore being processed and some copper ore. Once we get into more of a standard flow of metal refinery work, the system will work perfect. Unfortunately, we can't count this liquid reservoir in our 13 that is required. So I think the next best place to put these liquid reservoirs is actually in the, all this water. Now, I don't plan on having this water tank here forever, but for right now, it is a great thermal dump. All that 30 degree polluted water is coming through and helping stabilize the water. So even when some of the hot polluted water coming from the metal refinery comes through, it also quickly comes down to 30 degrees. As you can see right now, because the metal refinery is dumping out, it's coming in at 56 degrees, but it leaves at 27. Some of this abyssalite here looks like it can go away. I might be able to get an insulated tile in some of these spots without boiling all this water over as long as we do it fairly quick. And it'd be great to be able to capture a little bit more space being used by this abyssalite. Let's try that out. I think we'll start off by putting one insulated tile there, one here, and so on and so forth. It should be fine. I mean, what's the worst could happen? And then we'll make sure we corner build those tiles before we let them be exposed to all this water. And the first insulated tile is in. And as you can see, it's only 25 degrees right now. Of course, it's only cycle 81. Give this a few hundred cycles and it'll be pretty hot as well. And there's that abyssalite sitting at 380 degrees. Lucky for us, abyssalite doesn't have a thermal conductivity. So the debris is just going to sit there at 380 degrees for just about ever. Well, Echo, if that's the case, why did you worry about removing it in the first place? <laughs> Uh, well, that's because there's a little known thing that the water would actually transfer with the abyssalite with a zero thermal conductivity. Don't ask me. Post about it in the clay forums. Trust me, you'll have a good time. With the leveling complete, we now have room for another six liquid reservoirs, which gets us up to the 13 required buffer tanks. The great thing about these buffer tanks here is they're also going to help keep a thermal equilibrium here in this water pool. Because we're going to be dumping all this water into the liquid reservoirs and then letting it slowly seep out, all the hot polluted water that's coming in is going to get averaged with the polluted water that's been sitting there for X amount of cycles. And so those temperatures will average, basically deleting heat in the process. And one thing we can do to make sure that these liquid reservoirs are transferring heat to the surrounding environment as efficiently as possible is change out some of these abyssalite tiles to something more conductive. And now I don't believe abyssalite will transfer with, say, metal tiles, but I'm not going to take any chances. Oh, uh, who am I kidding? Of course we're going to take some chances. We're going to grab some copper metal tiles and just see how this goes. Now you might be wondering why I'm putting the metal tile in this position here. And that's because if you grab a liquid reservoir and you move it around before it's being built, you can tell that this is the tile of interest here because that's where your mouse stays. So I suspect that the thermal transfer happens more at this tile than it does anywhere else. Now, as you can see here, the water does not like being in contact with this 630 degree abyssalite. So I'd rather move this as quickly as possible because I don't like all that heat being dumped into the water. But our theory was correct. The abyssalite will not transfer into the metal tiles, but it has no problems transferring into the water. Because as you can see, in this tile right here is 5 kilos worth of 102.4 degree steam. Luckily, there's enough surrounding water to cool it right back down. But look at that. The metal tile, despite touching the 596 degree abyssalite, is sitting at 32.5 degrees and dropping. Now, I definitely wouldn't want to put the metal tile in this position here because the metal tile would have no problems at all transferring with this tile of diamond. But like I said, I believe the liquid reservoir transfers most of its thermals through this tile here, so it should help. 
Now we're pushing the limits here. Jason Stewart had the necessary skill points to be able to learn mechatronics engineering. Unfortunately, their morale is now at a 12 out of 12. But we now have a mechatronics engineer, which means at the minimum we can put in some of the shipping requirements for the Dreco ranches. Although our mealwood is not too happy because the polluted water is at 30.3 degrees, which is just a smidge too hot for the millwood. I'm not worried about it in the long term, though, because the thermal aqua tuner is going to take care of all of our thermal issues pretty quickly. I was getting ready to put some copper ore rails in, and I realized we are completely out of copper ore. Now, we've been able to turn a lot of it into refined copper, but the fact that we're out of one of the base ores that we started with is a little concerning which means we need to resort to using iron ore, which is our eventual source of steel. So hopefully our meteor friends start dropping off some copper ore. On the morale front, I'm sure some of you have wondered why we don't make this into a great haul. Because the mess hall is only giving us a plus 3 morale, and considering Jason is at that 12 out of 12, the great haul would be very helpful. Well, the problem is, this room is 24 tiles. A great haul would require 32. And I don't know if the extra three morale is worth sacrificing the additional space to be used in a great hall. Taking a further look at it, this time when I went to check on Jason's morale, it was actually sitting at an 18. Basically what I figured out is it's because this last cycle they had a standard meal, which gave them a plus four morale. So my guess is that they had an omelet instead of some pickled meal. Either way, Jason's stuck doing mechatronics engineering, so we're just going to have some days that they're happier than others. I could go in and restrict everybody to not eat omelets except for Jason, which would save enough omelets to keep their morale a little bit higher, but I don't think it's that big of a deal. Our wonderful buffer tank system down here is complete, and everything is flowing as expected. You'll notice that our liquid reservoir here that is the output to the metal refinery is completely empty. And we're actually ready to start queuing up some beautiful steel, which I think we're gonna. We'll start with two tons. And you might be wondering, how is this area here performing with all the heat? Well, absolutely wonderful. The temperature in this area is hovering around 30 degrees. First, being benefited by the wheeze warts here, but also because we have two pairs of radiant liquid pipes. The first one takes some of that wonderful polluted water chill that's coming in at 30 degrees and dumps it in here. The second one's allowing the clean water coming out of the water sieve to dump some of its heat, and that way as it makes its way up all the way to these bristle blossoms, it's a little bit cooler. As it stands, this area is around 28 degrees, the bristle blossom sitting at 29. So we're on the verge of the ability to be able to grow these bristle blossoms because the bristle blossoms like to stay under 30 degrees. Speaking of which, this mealwood's doing a lot better. I decided that since I'm bringing a bunch of chill water in here anyways, I don't think there was a reason to insulate in this room, which was just containing the heat being produced by the Dreco. So now that it's sharing with the surrounding environment, the mealwood is growing once again. One thing on the to-do list that I wanted to mention is you'll notice this liquid lock is full of all that beautiful brine that we grabbed from the printing pod in the past couple of episodes. I told you it would come in handy. But what I'd like to do is put a couple of suits here, and that way the duplicates don't have to get sopping wet every time they go through here. Not to mention the major eye irritation that is being caused from the hydrogen. Suits are on the docket because I believe we're going to need to put some suits up here. Which, it's a good thing we're about to start this project because one of the pieces of abyssalite has already broken. A couple more untimely meteor hits and we'd have some meteors inside the base. To start off with, we've moved all the mealwood production to go inside the pip ranch, which works out pretty well. Because as we said before, we wanted to use this space to the best of our ability. We only have 10 mealwoods growing, but we have another 5 on standby because quite frankly we're up to 50,000 calories. And it's probably because of all the omelets these pips are producing and some of the barbecue from the few critters that we are running. Now, unfortunately, to start off this project, we're going to need to put some bunker tiles and some bunker doors. The bunker tiles aren't too bad at only 100 kilos. The bunker doors are horrible at 500. But I have a plan that might get us away with only having to use one bunker door. Give me a minute to let the steel production ramp up and 
Let me see what I can come up with. By the way, with steel production, the polluted water comes out at 85 degrees. But as soon as it hits this first liquid reservoir, it instantly cuts down to about 50 degrees. And by the time it hits the second liquid reservoir, it's down to 31. Now, as long as we're not pumping continuous steel through this metal refinery, this could be our final metal refinery setup. The temperature around here is still wonderful at around 33 degrees. And this water tank is averaging about 25 degrees. Now, step one at the beginning of this system is how do we crack into this? Your first instinct might be to dig out the abyssalite, clear all this out before you put your system in. There's a problem with that, though. All this regolith is sitting at 317 degrees. So as soon as you dig out all this abyssalite, the regolith is going to come drop down here and cause this entire area to heat up. And once you heat up a small area like your mini base, you're going to have a world of a time trying to get rid of that heat. So the first thing we're going to do is put in the cooling system. Unfortunately, we're still waiting on a glossy Dreco. The alternative is we could bust into this oil reservoir and start producing oil and then petroleum and then make some plastic out of it. But I don't want to start spending the massive sand cost it is to clean all that polluted water to provide the oil well the one kilo of second that it requires. So I think we're just going to do some other stuff around here while we wait for a wonderful glossy Dreco. But then again, this 8-cycle old Dreco is only at a 4% chance of laying a glossy Dreclet egg. Then we gotta wait for it to hatch, and then we gotta wait for it to grow up before it can be sheared. So it might be quicker just to get a quick plastic press going. Lucky for us, we're not too far away on the research front. Just a couple of researches until we get the oil well, which will also give us the petroleum generator. Which, oddly enough, the oil refinery comes before the oil well. But you need the oil well in order to get the crude oil that you'd refine with the oil refinery. Seems like they're backwards. Now, I definitely don't want to go on full plastic production using this oil. Because it's going to create way too much heat. But we only need 200 kilos worth of plastic to create the steam turbine to be able to cool this area down when we drop all the regolith. The good news is when you put the oil well on top of the oil reservoir, one of the byproducts is natural gas. And that's great because we're going to be able to feed that to natural gas generators, which is going to help keep our coal usage down. It's not great because it creates a lot of heat and requires even more infrastructure. And we can't put it over here. The reason why is because we need to save this entire area for our future rocketry program. So I suppose it's time to start to scush everything over, which we're going to do just by constructing a bunch of regular tiles until we have enough room. So we've managed to scush all the water over. Yes, scush is a very technical term, but we still have a little bit of water in here. It's not going to be that big of a deal. We're going to have a liquid pump down here anyways. Now, we did have to relocate all the liquid pipes and the oxygen pipes that were going through here because this area is going to get very, very hot. The idea is that we're going to make a natural gas oil well combined system to where we can contain all the heat right in here. The only thing keeping this stuff within temps is going to be the oil coming out of the reservoir and the water going in it. Additionally, you'll notice that we put a bunch of insulated tiles here and this here is the exact line because you can see any higher and we'd interfere with what's going to be our opening for our rocketry program. Because that line of departure being this wall here, we're gonna have to get a little bit creative uh oh, I think I've trapped the dupes. We're going to have to get a little bit creative with the liquid lock that we need for the oil reservoir. We also going to need to put some suits in here. Hence the reason why we've backed the liquid lock up against this wall. Because we wouldn't have been able to fit suits over through here. Because again, eventually there's going to be a rocket sitting here. Okay, here's the temporary plan. It's questionable. We're going to strap an oil well onto this. And we're going to allow the oil to come drip down here. When we do that, the oil is going to get pumped up and be dropped off through this liquid vent. This is only temporary because we want to fill this with an oil liquid lock. At the same time, we need everything under here complete. Because once it's set, the duplicates aren't going to be able to get back down here. The reason why is because we need to seal it off so the oil only goes down here. So we have our Atmosuit docks in here and over by the Dreco area. The auction, it's not great. We've just got it all being pulled off of one line. Hindsight being 2020, I would have made a system with two electrolyzers, so I could have gone up to the 10 to 12 duplicates that we were talking about earlier. Although I did know this was temporary at the time, 
But now that I've built it into such a system, I'm like, oh, do I really need to build another one? We'll cross that bridge when we get there. For now, it'll just take a little bit of time for the Atmo suit docks to fill, but being that the duplicants don't need to spend too much time here, and they won't need to spend too much time in the sharing area, I don't believe the oxygen demand for these suits are going to be very high. Now, on the power front, we did have to extend the spine. I don't know if we can call it a spine so much as a spider web because it's going to be going all throughout our base because we're going to need little transformers everywhere. In this case, this transformer is going to be driving a couple of liquid pumps, the oil well, and these docks. We also had to put a heavy watt joint plate in here. Now this is going to get hot and I know that the heavy watt joint plate is going to transfer some of its thermals to this water. My hope is that all the polluted water coming through it is going to be enough to counteract the heat coming out into it. We'll have to see. Now the process of building this because I know I'm not going to be able to get down here once it's complete is a little different. You can see we're putting all the pipes in, all the automation wires in, and hopefully when we're done we're going to be able to destroy these ladders, build the natural gas generator right here, and then seal it in. That way the oil only dumps off over to this side. And I realize I did forget the intake, so we're going to go here just to put it down so I can see where the intake is, and it looks like it's on the very bottom two over from the left. So this is going to have to be a gas bridge. The other gas line that you're looking at is where all the carbon dioxide is going to be going. It's going to be taking a trip underneath the oxygen through the water tank where it finally gets dropped off at the carbon skimmer. At this point we're sitting over 70,000 calories and our oxygen system is doing just fine so I think we're actually going to take another dupe. This Amari has triple interest in ranching, cooking, and supplying. But interestingly enough, they also have mole hands and interior decorating. Their only negative is they're, they're squeamish. Now we already have a cook and we already have a rancher, but Amari is going to be able to provide extra hands and be able to do both of those. Welcome to the mini base, Eric W. Now we're going to start Eric W off in grilling for no other reason than I just like to have two cooks going at one time. That way, whenever one cook is sleeping, the other one is still doing all the cooking. We've already added their mess table, and we're putting down their cot now. I've also wanted to highlight that we added a bunch of these adorable new cloud prints. It was one of the blueprints I got from the new clay reward system. And what's great is it provides a decent amount of decor. And that decor, combined with what they're eating during the day, has morale up between 14 and 21. Not shabby. In another stroke of bad fortune, it looks like we have finally ran out of sandstone as well. I don't know how we're going to be able to keep this up. As you can see, there's not a lot of tiles left. Now running out of sandstone is not the worst that could happen, but it's definitely not one of the materials that you wanted to run out of. I guess now we're going to be switching over to sedimentary rock. I mean, that looks fine. And I also realized I think I made a terrible mistake. I went with the cloud print in the mess hall, whereas I think I should have went with the pastel blue. Now we're creating them all out of granite anyways because they have the plus 20% decor bonus, but I was about to put some beautiful drywall in their barracks as well, and I wanted to put cloud prints, but that would be two samesies. So we're just going to go with the pastel blue into the barracks. I know, the run is pretty much ruined, but it is what it is. One of the other weird bugs I wanted to show you on mini base was that a lot of the flying critters like to play the bouncy bouncy game. Every once in a while, I'll just need to restart. Not because there's anything wrong with the bouncy bouncy game. It just kind of tells me that something else is going wrong with the simulation. And after a quick restart, they no longer want to play the bouncy bouncy game. And I suppose I probably should put some bunker tiles here because I don't think we're going to get to this today. What do you think the chances are that Jason and Angry Forest are going to build a bunker tile around each other's faces? Oh yeah. This is happening. That doesn't look pleasant. It looks like Jason got out and left Angry Forest to fend for themselves. Interestingly enough, it doesn't look like they run out of oxygen while they're entombed. While Angry Forest admittedly has low oxygen, they seem to be able to breathe just fine. So what's the negative of having an entombed dupe? Uh, their bladder is slowly rising, so I suppose eventually they would pee themselves. Now this side specifically, we're going to go ahead and insulate in because it's going to be a long time until we're over here and ready to build our rocketry program. And eventually this abyssalite would be destroyed, the hot regolith would sit on the bunker tile and end up heating our entire base up. So we'll insulate it in and then we can forget about this side for quite some time. Well it looks like we're ready down here for our natural gas generator. Hopefully we have everything. Hopefully we can pick up this debris and hopefully we can still build 
the natural gas generator. Yes, our plan relies a lot on hope. You know, I suppose we could still do a great haul if we just lifted the entire bathroom up by one. I think that's a decent enough plan. Give me one second. Doesn't that just look wonderful? And now for our efforts, we have a great haul. We still get our latrine and our barracks and some absolute beautiful decor. I went with the clouds in the bathroom. It seemed kind of nice while the dupes were going potty. Here's the moment we've all been waiting for. Our steel natural gas generator is going in. Everything else in here is made of steel as well. The two liquid pumps, the battery, and the gas pump. The last thing I have to make is the oil well. And the oil well has an unusually high overheat temperature, so I don't think we need to make it out of steel. Now we have to figure out how to get the clean water in, and I think it's just going to be as simple as tapping off of here and driving it directly into the oil well. But as you can see, we're down to 405 kilos worth of sand, so it's time to queue up some more and make this meal wood even hotter. In fact, we're even going through the process of moving the Dreco ranch. This seemed like a convenient space because it was relatively close to the conveyor chute. And right now, this area is only 26 degrees. While it won't take too long for it to heat up, at least we'll be able to get some Dreco reproduction here done before we can provide some permanent cooling to this area here. Now, I had almost messed up because I was getting ready to feed a bunch of carbon dioxide and oxygen to the natural gas generator. Before we continue though, I think it's fine that we block this off and then we're gonna vacuum this area out, which will be fine until the oil well starts producing that natural gas. So this will have an atmosphere of carbon dioxide and everything else. Well, until it starts producing polluted water and then there'll be some polluted oxygen in here, it'll be messy. But this should only be oil and natural gas. Water is starting to flow over to our oil well, so we're going to go ahead and stop entry and exit from this manual airlock and allow this gas pump to completely vacuum out this whole area. The next time we open it, there should be oil in this tile right here, which will make a lock, and then we'll be able to remove the manual airlock. Ah, beautiful crude oil. There's over 500 kilos worth of crude oil in this tile, so I think we're good to go ahead and destroy this manual airlock. And it looks like it's right about on time, considering we've only got milligrams worth of carbon dioxide left in here. I love it when a plan comes together. We're going to continue to let the crude oil drop into here. We may have to build a tile here and then delete it just to get rid of the carbon dioxide to make a full lock. But we'll wait until there's plenty of crude oil in all of these tiles. So I suppose once this is full, we'll then be able to bring the oil right through here. And I can't believe it, but we're actually going to be building an oil refinery. I know, I feel dirty just saying it. Now, there's a few reasons why you'd never see these oil refineries. First, because they require 10 kilos worth a second worth of crude oil. But they only give you 5 kilos per second worth of petroleum. Yeah, you get a little bit of natural gas in return, but I think we'd all rather have the petroleum. So it'd be smart to sort of build a permanent spot for this because I don't think a petroleum boiler is in our future. But to tell you the truth, I just want to get enough petroleum out of it so that we can then put down a polymer press. And the polymer press is going to give us that plastic, considering our Dreco is being completely stubborn and won't lay a glossy Dreco egg. Rude. Well, the good news is we've got some natural gas production online, just as we planned. This entire chamber is going to be filling with natural gas, which we're going to be feeding to this natural gas generator that's going to be supplying power to the rest of our colony. We have this battery set on 9060, so this room in effect is going to become sort of a natural gas battery, storing up all the potential power until such time the natural gas generator needs it. We've set our coal generators down to 9040, so they are a secondary and backup source of power. Oh dear goodness, I've made a boo-boo. Once again, I have flipped a bridge. How many hours do I need to play this game to where I'm not going to flip the bridges? Now we're going to make a whole big mess. I suppose we can go in through here. Yeah, we're going to let some of this water go, but this pump will get it. I was like, why isn't the gas generator working? Oh, because it can't output any of its carbon dioxide it needs to. Ah, that is much better. And the carbon dioxide will flow over to the carbon skimmer, and now all is right in the world. Now, getting the oil refiner in here has been somewhat of a pickle. In the end, we're just gonna brute force it. I tried to figure out some sort of creative way to get another liquid lock in here, but there just isn't enough room considering we were pushed up against this neutronium and where our eventual rocket is gonna go. And the reason why I wanted to put it in a liquid lock situation is because it's gonna be outputting natural gas. I suppose there would have been enough room if I would have made this crude oil lock here 
and just had the ore refinery in the same sealed up location with the oil well. Hold on. See, here's the problem. We could put a liquid lock here with enough room to have the ladder run here, but then you wouldn't really have any room for any suits. This area is just not wide enough for a lot of applications. Unless, of course, I put the suits up here. Then they came down a little bit and then did all their activities down here. Let me try again. All right, so we have the semblance of a system. I really wish this one piece of neutronium wasn't here. Because as it stands, I'm only going to be able to get one suit in here. Because eventually I have to put a door here because all the rocket exhaust is going to leak into here. That's a future echo problem. I wonder if I can shift it down by one more. That way I could have two suits. I'd feel a lot better with two suits. Okay, we have another system in play. This one whole corridor is going to hold the natural gas generator, the oil well, some gas pumps, the oil refinery and somehow a transformer. Our next step is to vacuum this whole area out again. We're then gonna drop this liquid lock, conveniently enough, right over this area, so it's not gonna have a problem oil mixing with oil, and then we'll start building this liquid lock up proper style. By the way, despite the delays, it looks like we're still gonna beat this one direct out of plastic. So it was a good thing that we put down the bunker tiles, because as you can see, the meteors hit the bunker tiles so hard, they actually fractured the insulated tile. The good news, though, is that all this is insulated. I had forgotten to put the one insulated tile here, and as such, some of that heat had already bled through. The bunker tiles are already sitting 140 degrees. Luckily, this side is not yet broken through, but if it does happen too soon, we'll go ahead and put a bunch of insulated tiles around these as well. Well, here it is in all of its duct tape glory. Let's follow the chain of materials, shall we? Polluted water comes out of the polluted vent, goes through all the buffer tanks, then continues on, through the metal refinery, and then to some more buffer tanks. Then the polluted water goes around until it hits this 50-50 split, half of it going towards the tree, half of it going to this water sieve, where we then have clean water. Clean water goes into the electrolyzer and the carbon skimmer, where the water then rounds the corner and heads off into the oil well. The oil well creates, you know, oil, so long as this liquid reservoir is not 90% full. Once it is 90% full, it'll send an automation signal and disable the oil well. No sense in creating oil if our petroleum storage is full. The oil is going to head up through here, go into our oil refinery, creating beautiful petroleum and more natural gas, where the petroleum will fill this tank. This tank eventually will supply fuel for petroleum rocket, but for now, it's just going to give us a couple hundred kilos of plastic. Incidentally, all the natural gas being produced by both the oil well, when it is vented, and the oil refinery is collected by this gas pump connected to an automation sensor that feeds into this natural gas generator. The natural gas generator emits polluted water and gives us wonderful power. The polluted water joins the line and continues the circle of life. Incidentally, we have a bridge correctly placed to where this line will have priority so no matter what, the polluted water will be able to join up on this line and prevent this natural gas generator from flooding. Here we are creating some wonderful petroleum. The petroleum's coming out at a reasonable 75 degrees. Incidentally, we ran out of steel, so we made this liquid reservoir out of gold amalgam and the large power transformer out of gold. We'll upgrade those to steel once we have some more. Now our polymer press is just going to make a mess because once again, this is temporary because eventually this Dreco is gonna get off its hind quarters and start laying us some glossy Dreco eggs. As it stands, once again, this Dreco is about to lay another egg and its chances of laying a glossy Dreco egg this time are 36%. You can do it, buddy. The polymer press is just gonna make a mess. It emits steam and carbon dioxide I suppose we could turn all this into mesh tiles as well, but it's not going to matter for much longer because eventually it's going to be hot enough in this area where the steam is just going to stay steam. Not what we want. But I don't plan on running this polymer press for too long. After all, we already have 60 kilos worth of plastic, and the whole reason we're doing this is so we can create one steam turbine, and that requires 200 kilos of plastic. And that's going to be the subject of the next episode. Oh, that was morbid. We just saw a puff die right in front of our eyes. But as I was saying, that's going to be the subject of next episode, where we're going to put a steam turbine here, a thermo aqua tuner, we're going to provide some cooling, we're going to cool down some regolith, and we're going to be well on our way to sustainability.
Well, I hope you're still enjoying this series as much as I am. It definitely turned some of the building mechanics and how you go about doing things on its head. I'm looking forward to hearing what you have to say about this episode. So until next time, I'll talk to you soon.